Amen. Are you praying for Metro? We are, as we said earlier, we are a people who believe in the power of prayer. And this is, there's a lot to pray for, frankly. And this is, it's, it's kind of a, um, there's a lot of pressure involved in this now because we have a whole new year coming up just next week. A whole new set of endeavors, a whole new set of, of programs and events. We have another year of McCrest coming up. We have another year of VBS oh, coming up. We have, we, we have all these events, another Sterling Fest. We have, we, we have all these things that are about to happen. Another Friends Day. We have these things to pray for. Because 2016, if it presents anything, it presents even more opportunities to serve and work for the Lord. Amen? We have before us opportunities to carry the ball for God. And I ask that you are praying for that daily. Because God is at work in this place. And we need to be praying for that majesty to be laid bare so that we are not the only ones that see it, but all of those around us who live in the world, who are, who are trying to find their own way through it, leaning on their own understanding that they might see the glory of God in this place and might see how dependent they need to be upon it. Will you join me in a word of prayer? Mighty God, Lord, I ask that you bless us in those endeavors that we face in 2016. I ask that you give us, you give us endurance, you give us courage, you give us, you give us steadfastness to remain firm in your word so that we can meet those challenges that you have laid bare before us, God. Help us to stand in the gap for you because you have so richly stood in the gap for us. Thank you for the salvation that we know through your son. Thank you for the gift that he is to us. Help us to give that gift to others. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We just finished a holiday of gifts, of gift giving. Um, one thing we used to do, whenever I think of, of gift giving, I can't help but think of this. We, it's a tradition that, that we still do to this day. I, I'm going to be having our, we're going to have our Christmas <laughs> this next week coming up with, with my family. We had our Christmas with our kids on the day, but we have another Christmas coming up with my, my parents, my brother, my sister, and their families. Uh, we're leaving tomorrow for uh, to go to Arkansas for that. Um, um, oh, and just on a side note, I told everybody I was waiting to see Star Wars with my brother. I, I was weak. I didn't wait. Um, my kids came and was like, Dad, you saw Star Wars without us? And I said, look, I'm, I'm, I'm a human being. Uh, <laughs> no, but we're, uh, we do, there's a tradition that we do at our family where... We take, uh, we don't do so much do it with the older kids. We do it with our kids now because they're the youngest. Um, when, when the uh, nieces and nephews start having grandkids, we'll, we'll do it with them because my kids are getting older. But the night before we open presents, we typically take the little kids to the dollar store. And we tell them, go nuts, buy presents for everybody. And it is amazing what a little kid can buy an adult at a dollar store. We don't give them any guidance. We just let them go. I'll never forget one, one, uh, <laughs> one Christmas years ago when Reagan, who is in college now, was little enough to do this, she went and she bought all these presents. She bought me women's deodorant, which I took as a double slap, by the way. Uh, she get, and I said, oh, it's women's deodorant. She said, yes, because I know you like to smell good. Like, I do like to smell good, and like a man. Um, <laughs> she bought her dad a figurine of an African-American couple dancing. My brother is not African-American. Uh, and she, and he, he's looking at it saying, sweetie, why did you get this? like, well, because you like to dance with me. Isn't it amazing how little kids don't see color? Isn't it amazing? And... She bought my dad um, a jar of spicy Dijon mustard. No one knows why. <laughs> she just saw it and thought of Papa for some reason, and she gave it to him. It's funny. Um, 
we, when we think about gifts and how meaningful gifts can be. Um, I'm using a gift this morning. I showed some of you. This was my Christmas present from my, my lovely wife this year, a new, brand new Bible. Um, this is meaningful to me because, not, not because of how much I wanted it, and I did want it, and how much I like it. I do like it, but this is meaningful because of who it came from. Doesn't that change it? Our, our kids will occasionally leave us little notes on our pillows at night. And I, I don't, don't awe, because that's just them sucking up. Because um, <laughs> Harmony knows what side her bread is buttered on, okay? Um, <laughs> but they'll say nice things, and typically they say nicer things to mom than they say to me, but they still say nice things. And then these little drawings, little notes and misspelled words and that if, if I was an English teacher, I would not have as near much, as much appreciation for. But why, why does something that is so simple, I mean, it's just crayon and paper for crying out loud. Why does it have so much meaning? I have notes hanging in my office that I've received from my kids and other kids. I've got, I've got uh, she's not here to defend herself, I've got a little... I, I got a Darth Vader cartoon drawn by Emily Carter in my office. It's these, these little things that, that just mean something because of not what they are, but who they come from. Gifts can be powerful things. Amen? What's interesting is that when you, when you begin to study on any level, when you begin to study... New Testament Greek, even if you just, and, and believe me, you can take all the, um, you can take all the Greek I know and write it on the back of a three by five card, okay? I, it's, I, I should have done, I now realize that I should have paid more attention to my Greek class in school. <laughs> but I, at any level, if you say it, one of the things that you immediately notice is that the word grace in Greek, which is a word that in English in the New Testament we are deeply concerned with, Right? I mean, Ephesians 2 really sews it up for us. By grace you have been saved through faith, not of your own doing, so that none of you may boast, but you are his workmanship. These are, these are powerful things. When we, read, when we read the statements, but grace be to God in Ephesians. But thanks be to God who through his marvelous grace, the riches of his grace, grace is something that we are, are deeply interested in as New Testament Christians. But one of the things you notice when you study New Testament Greek, when you get to that word grace, is that you could exchange in English, you could exchange the word grace for the word gift, and nothing would change. It would read identically to how it reads with grace instead of gift, because they're the same word. They're the same word. When I think about the gifts that we get from our kids, from our spouses, from our loved ones, from our parents, our siblings, when I think about these gifts, I cannot help but think of the fact that we have a God who gives gifts. Who do you give gifts to? You give gifts to the people who mean the most to you. Now imagine that. We have a God who gives us gifts. What does that tell you about the way you mean to God? How much you mean to God? That He gives you gifts. He gives us amazing gifts. He gives us gifts of life. Gifts of security. He gives us blessings every day. And when we consider these great things that happen to us and we, we can't help but see God's grace, His gift-giving love in those things. A, a, a personal story from this. I've shared this before, but it, it, it hit me hard. I remember years and years ago when Aiden was uh, real little, he was still in diapers. Um, he, we were at, we were at uh, church one Sunday morning and it was at the end of a pay period and we had, a, or it was in the middle of a pay period. We had, we had a week to go still and we were just straight up out of money. You ever been there? We were just, I mean, just straight up out of money. We had a $5 bill to our name. That's it. And it was in my wife's purse, which is, should tell you something about how I spend money. 
So we're at, we're at church service. I'm a youth minister. I'm not sitting with Stephanie. I'm sitting with the teens a couple of aisles over. Stephanie is there. And she's, she's sitting there in church and she's got this little boy in diapers. And she knows two things. One, that tray is coming. And two, that $5 bill is all we have left and we're probably going to need diapers here again pretty quick. And I'm not in the row to encourage her. This is all Steph. She can see that tray circling before it gets to her because she's somewhere in the middle. And she's thinking about it. Should I keep it? Should I give it? Should I keep it? Should I give it? Should I keep it? Should I give it? Finally, it gets to her, and she, she told me later that she just had this thought that I need to give this more than I need to use it. And she put it in the tray. And that's a leap of faith, right? I mean, this is, this is nothing except a leap of faith. This is the last piece of money we have to earn, and we don't know what we're going to do. There's no, there's no, there's, there's no security <laughs> at all. And she puts it in the tray. She comes up to me after the service. She said, well, we're out of money. I don't know what we're going to do. And I said, okay, well, we'll work it out. And then we're on our way out to the parking lot. A little old lady comes up. She comes up to me. This isn't a holiday. It's not a birthday. Just out of the blue. She comes up and she says, I just want to tell you what a good job you're doing and how much I love you and your family and, and just you mean so much to me. And she passes me a card. We get to the car, we open it up, there's a hundred dollar bill inside. We have a God who gives gifts. We have a God who loves us more than he loves himself. Because that's who you give gifts to, amen? But more than those little things that remind you that he loves you, he gave you one all-important gift. And that's the gift I want to read about this morning. The gift that Isaiah talks about in Isaiah chapter 9. Turning there real quick, because there's a lot here. It's only two verses. But there's so much here for us to pick apart. He starts off chapter 9 by talking about how though we are currently in darkness, there's a moment coming in which that darkness will be removed. Isaiah is a book of prophecy. It's a book of messianic prophecy. In fact, commonly, a little tongue-in-cheek jokingly, Isaiah is commonly referred to by many as the gospel of Isaiah because of all the statements he makes in reference to Jesus Christ. And here's one, one of the most famous. He says, verse 6, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Church, We've had two lessons so far, and this is the third to end the series, on the incarnation of Jesus Christ. We've talked about the gift that he is. We talked last week about how the incarnation represents the first move in a game that would result in our salvation and how important it is for us. I think Paul put it very eloquently in his delivering of the, of the communion message. We had some issue with the mic in case you missed it. What he said was this, that without the resurrection, no resurrection, no salvation, no cross, no resurrection, no manger, no cross, no incarnation, no manger. It's all interwoven together. God's eternal purpose, his plan, his gift to save you. These are powerful things. But notice what Isaiah will say about this. He will put, refocus that to this idea of who Christ is ultimately and why that gift is so powerful. We've talked about the results of that gift. 
in great detail over the last two weeks. But now I want you to refocus from the results of that gift to the nature of the gift itself, to think about what was given. I heard this verse discussed in a podcast this past week that I was listening to. And it was recording a conversation, an argument, a debate between a a person who denies, who believes in the existence of Jesus Christ but denies his deity. And this passage was given to him to show him that the Bible affirms the deity of Christ, the full divinity of Christ. And he reads this verse because look what it says. He says, For to us a child is born, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called. Now look at these names it calls Jesus. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, that's Elohim there, by the way, in in Hebrew, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The divine names are in there. Mighty God, Everlasting Father. And the man quoting the verse said, see what it says here about Jesus. If Jesus isn't God, how can he be called Mighty God? If he isn't divine, how can he be called everlasting father? And he even went to show, he even went to show that in Hebrew, one possible translation, it's more commonly rendered this way, but one possible translation of that phrase, and his name shall be called, in Hebrew, it might mean, and his name is called. Present tense. Now, if Jesus is a present tense name, hundreds of years before the incarnation, before that manger, before Mary and Joseph were even born, who could he be other than God? And you know what the response was to that? The man looked at him and smiled because they were on on friendly terms. He looked at him and he smiled and he said, that doesn't say that's Jesus. Jesus' name isn't in there. Where does it say that that's Jesus? And his opponent had much the same response that I was feeling in that moment, looking at him and going, what? (laughs) Really? Really? It has to be Jesus. Why? Because only Jesus can lay claim not to just these names, but to the nature of what is said about him in the beginning of the verse. What does it say? It says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is what? Given. Church, there is powerful imagery in that statement. Yes, these are great things. Just picking them apart again real quick. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Jesus is our Prince of Peace, amen? He is the Prince that creates peace between God and man. He is our Everlasting Father in the sense that He is as much God as the Father is God, and He is everlasting, He is eternal. Jesus has claim to the true divine name. Y-H-W-H, Yahweh, I am that I am. Before Abraham was, I am. Jesus can call himself that. Mighty God. If Jesus is anything, he is mighty. Amen? Mighty enough to get into the ring with death and win. Mighty enough to remove the sting of death. Mighty enough that the grave itself, which holds all of us, cannot hold him. He is mighty God. Wonderful counselor? Oh, of course he is. Ask the blind man if Jesus is wonderful counselor. Ask the leper who Jesus took the time to touch, a man who was by nature of being a leper, by value of being a leper, forever removed from human contact, that Jesus took the time to get on his knees with and touch. I would put to you that the reason why the leper dances for joy is not just that his leprosy has been cured, but because he has a God who touched him. Is Jesus a wonderful counselor? a writer of wrongs, a healer of wounds. Is he these things? Of course. What else does it say about him? Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and hold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. It says, and the government will be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. What does he mean by government? He means the church. Another word we could trade in there, though it is the word government in Hebrew, we could trade in another word there and keep the context the same, would be kingdom. What is the kingdom? You and I are the kingdom. That he has established his kingdom in a world that hates and despises it, yet even though it hates and despises it, it will last forever. Why? Because he is mighty God. 
because he is everlasting father. You and I have comfort. You and I have security in the kingdom of God because of our savior. But church, as powerful as these are, they do not begin to compare to the beauty laid out for us in those opening statements of verse six. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. There is imagery there that is more powerful than all the statements that follow it. And here's why. I want you to imagine for a moment as we close a young boy, a child by our standards, but a man by his cultures, following his father up a dark, craggy mountain. carrying wood and flint and iron to make an altar to God. His father has been quiet the journey. Said more than, said no more than three words to him the whole time. But he notices more than his father's unwillingness to speak. He notices the somber look on his face conflict sweat on his brow and then with shock he realizes one more piece of very vital information that while they have wood and while they have a knife they do not have a lamb and the son looks to his father and says where's the lamb Father with world weary eyes and tears rimming his eyelids looks at the boy and says, God will provide. Then they reach the summit. His father commands him to help him build the altar as they stack wood into a pyre. His father produces rope from his pack and tells the boy to lay down upon it. Part of him wants to flee. Part of him wants to rail and run because he knows what happens to things that lay on that altar. He's seen it before. He knows what the rope is for. To calm the stirrings of a violently wild animal as it sees the blade. But he remembers his father's words from the trail. And he believes that his father loves him enough to not lie. And he told him that the Lord would provide. And while he had the strength to fight back, he lays down willingly upon it, letting his father bind him. And as they both weep openly now, maybe the first time he's ever seen his father cry. His father, his father approaches his bound form and he looks up and he sees the knife raised. And as it is on its way down to his throat, sound stops him and he hears the voice of God saying do not kill him for you have not kept your son from me unbind him let him go and then they hear a stirring in the bush and they turn and caught in the thicket is a lamb. And now crying for an entirely different reason, they take that lamb, Abraham binds it instead of Isaac, and they sacrifice to the Lord, offering as a burnt offering, and they name the place 
in Hebrew, the Lord will provide. There was a moment, church, in which a human man was asked to give his human son. A flawed man was asked to give a flawed son, but he was stopped, not just to test the faith of the man doing the giving, but to tell you and I something, that that son, as precious as he was, was not good enough. Because only one without blemish can lay upon that altar. Amen? Which of you are worthy to lay on that, wa- that altar? Isaac wasn't. I'm not. You're not. And when we think about that fact, it might fill us with fear and dread as it filled Isaac and Abraham with fear and dread. But church, we are comforted by this knowledge, by the same promise that Abraham spoke to Isaac on their way to the summit. The Lord will provide. If you and I cannot lay on the altar for God and make that sacrifice, God will give us the gift of one who can. And His name is Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. What makes that gift so powerful, church? Not what it is by itself. As powerful and mighty as it is by itself. But that's not what makes it so special to us. Not just what it is, but who it is from. Do you have the gift of Christ Jesus this morning? I hope so. Today can be Christmas morning for you if you don't. Today can be that moment where you realize that you have just been given everything you never knew you needed from a God who loves you more than himself, who knew you couldn't lay on the altar for yourself, so he laid on it for you. you would like to accept the gift this morning.